The world may call us crazy for this. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the world says. And that's one of the key steps on this path. We have to let go of any and all attachment to what anyone else has to say. We have to let go. It says right here, the man with the disciplined imagination is head and shoulders above the masses. Why? Because we're held to a higher standard. Welcome back to another episode of Daily Neville. I am your host, Josiah Brandt. Daily Neville is all about breaking down the teachings of Neville Goddard, making them easy to understand, easy to digest, easy to apply in 20 minutes or less. Today, we're continuing with Neville's famous book, Your Faith is Your Fortune. And this is the chapter that is all about the 12 disciples. Now, this episode in particular is a part two of this chapter. So if you missed the last episode, I invite you to start there and then come back to this as we're picking up right in the middle of this chapter titled The Twelve Disciples. Let's go ahead and dive right in. For this episode, we are continuing with the fifth disciple, and the fifth disciple is known as Philip. So let's go ahead and start there. The fifth quality, Neville writes, called the discipleship, is Philip. This is the one who asks to be shown the Father. The awakened man knows that the Father is the state of consciousness in which man dwells, and that this state, or Father, can be seen only as it is expressed. He knows himself to be the perfect likeness or image of that consciousness with which he is identified. So he declares, No man has at any time seen my Father, but I, the Son, who dwelleth in his bosom, have revealed him. Therefore, when you see me, the Son, you see my Father. For I come to bear witness of my Father. I and my Father, consciousness and its expression, God and man, are one. We're going to go ahead and start right there. So this is the disciple known as Philip. And Philip asks to be shown the Father. Now, this is the esoteric secret of Philip. No other person can see your father. Not in this world of flesh and blood. Can't see the father. Why? Because the father is within. But those who have seen me have seen the father. What does that mean? Well, I outpicture my entire world based upon the consciousness of being that I dwell in. So the consciousness of being that which I am, you know, I am that I am, the consciousness of being that I wear is my father. I and my father are one, but my father is greater than I, meaning that the father can be more than that which I'm wearing in this moment. But right now, what I'm wearing in this moment reveals to others the father. So if you have seen me, the son, you see my father. If you've seen me and my life and how I live things in the state that I'm in, you know what my father is, because this, what you see around me, is a perfect out picturing of my father. This world that you see me living in is the image and likeness of my father. Therefore, you can't see the father, but you can see me. And if you have seen me, you've seen the father. Continuing with Neville's words. This aspect of the mind, when disciplined, persists until ideas, ambitions, and desires become embodied realities. This is the quality which states, yet in my flesh shall I see God. It knows how to make the word flesh, how to give form to the formless. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now, God cannot be seen, right? Well, technically, God can be seen. It's all around you. Just like the Father cannot be seen, right? Well, actually, the Father can be seen can be revealed in you. I can look at you and I can see your father because the father is giving expression to the state of being through you. Same thing here. This is actually a quality of consciousness to discipline. And that quality of consciousness says, yet in my flesh shall I see God. There's a persistence to this. It's yet in my flesh I shall see God. This is a power statement. In my flesh, I shall see God, meaning that I will persist 
until that father state of being that I'm dwelling in is made perfectly manifested in the world of flesh. It knows how to make the word flesh, how to give form to the formless. How? Persistence. Persistence is how we make the word flesh, how we give form to the formless. Continuing with the sixth disciple. The sixth disciple is called Bartholomew. This quality is the imaginative faculty, which quality of the mind, once awake, distinguishes one from the masses. An awakened imagination places the one so awakened head and shoulders above the average man, giving him the appearance of a beacon of light in a world of darkness. No quality so separates man from man, as does the disciplined imagination. You may have noticed this. You may have noticed that others sometimes do not meet you in the realm of disciplined imagination. You may have noticed that a lot of others tend to believe what they see rather than giving faith to the formless. You may have noticed that you are somewhat alone or unique, or in this case, as Neville says, you are head and shoulders above the average man of the masses because your imagination is disciplined. You may notice that this makes you stand out and stand apart in many ways from so-called others. This is the separation of the wheat from the chef, Neville says. Those who have given the most to our society are artists, scientists, inventors, and others with vivid imaginations. Now, this is something that I speak about to a great extent in other places. And I talk about the future of humanity and how we're currently in this evolutionary cycle where we are allowing a lot of the normal preoccupations of mankind to be automated through technology, giving birth to artificial intelligence, giving birth to all sorts of technological processes and industries that are really very quickly shifting what we as humans are going to be doing on a daily basis moving forward. And what this means, whether the world sees it or not, I don't care. What I'm saying in this moment, I'm prophesying in this moment, what this means is that the faculty of imagination, although important from the very beginning, will only become more important as we go forward. And I believe that we are headed towards a society where imagination and creativity is actually venerated above pretty much any other faculty that can be developed by a human. Imagination and creativity will be the most important skills to be developed at some point in the future generations to come. And so you and I are on the leading edge of that now by venerating and honoring this quality and developing it, disciplining it actively with intention and on purpose. Should a survey be made, Neville writes, to determine the reason why so many seemingly educated men and women fail in their after-college years? Or should it be made to determine the reason for the different earning powers of the masses? There would be no doubt but that imagination played the important part. Such a survey would show that it is imagination which makes one a leader and the lack of of imagination that makes one a follower. That's probably the best tagline I could give to a channel like this. Imagination makes one a leader and is the lack of imagination which makes one a follower. Is there anything more rich than this? We're sitting on it right now in this very moment. Instead of developing the imagination of man, our education system oftentimes stifles it by attempting to put into the mind of man the wisdom he seeks. It forces him to memorize a number of textbooks, which all too soon are disproved by later textbooks. Education is not accomplished by putting something into man. Its purpose is to draw out of man the wisdom which is latent in him. May the reader call Bartholomew to discipleship, 
For only as this quality is raised to discipleship will you have the capacity to conceive ideas that will lift you beyond the limitations of man. The seventh disciple is called Thomas. This disciplined quality doubts or denies every rumor and suggestion that are not in harmony with that which Simon Peter has been commanded to let enter. Doubting Thomas. Now we understand the role that doubting Thomas plays as a disciplined quality of mind. I have disciplined the quality of mind known as Thomas to doubt, to actively doubt and deny every rumor and suggestion that are not in harmony with that which the guard at the door of my hearing has been commanded to let enter. I don't just turn it away at the door. I also doubt it and deny it actively. And that quality of mind which does so is Thomas. The man who is conscious of being healthy, not because of inherited health, diets, or climate, but because he is awakened and knows the state of consciousness in which he lives, will, in spite of the conditions of the world, continue to express health. He could hear through the press, the radio, and the wise men of the world that a plague was sweeping the earth, and yet he would remain unmoved and unimpressed. Thomas, the doubter, when disciplined, would deny that sickness or anything else which was not in sympathy with the consciousness to which he belonged had any power to affect him. This is so important for such obvious reasons that I'm going to reread these last two sentences again. Thomas, the disciplined quality which doubts and denies every rumor or suggestion not in harmony with what Simon Peter has been commanded to let enter, could hear through the press, the radio, the wise men or so-called experts of the world that a plague was sweeping the earth, and yet he would remain unmoved and unimpressed. Unmoved and unimpressed. Because that quality of mind, which we refer to as doubting Thomas, has been disciplined, unmoved and unimpressed, and remain in the consciousness of being that which we desire to be. We are not swayed in any other direction. This quality of denial, Neville writes, when disciplined, protects man from receiving impressions which are not in harmony with his nature. He adopts an attitude of total indifference to all suggestions that are foreign to that which he desires to express. Discipline denial is not a fight. It is not a struggle. It is total indifference. Earlier in these episodes of Daily Neville, Neville revealed to us that indifference is the knife that cuts while feeling is the nail that binds. And therefore, indifference is just as much a tool in our toolbox as disciplined creators, as is feeling. And so Neville is really surfacing an incredibly important point here. He's saying that we don't fight or struggle against the so-called experts of the world who tell us all these terrible things. Rather, we remain indifferent, unmoved. When we have disciplined this quality of mind, can hear anything and shrug it off. I don't care. I don't care. It doesn't affect me. It's not a part of my paradigm. It's not my worldview. The world may call us crazy for this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the world says. And that's one of the key steps on this path. We have to let go of any and all attachment to what anyone else has to say. We have to let go. It says right here, the man with the disciplined imagination is head and shoulders above the masses. Why? Because we're held to a higher standard. That's the bottom line. We don't judge the others for being at a lower standard. We don't look down upon them. 
We just understand that that's not the game we're playing. We're playing at a different level. This is our role. And we continue to stand where we are standing. We continue to occupy our state. We continue to outpicture and express the state that we're in. We continue to play our part. This is the role of our character. I'm going to play my character, not your character, not anyone else's character. I'm going to play me. And when I'm disciplined in that regard, yes, I am going to stand head and shoulders above the masses. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm indifferent to anything they have to say because I'm playing my own level of the game. My own level of the game when disciplined is exactly this. I'm denying and I'm doubting anything else that I am hearing that is not in harmony with my ideal state through the act of doubting Thomas, the quality of mind, which is doubting Thomas. And it's through the act of indifference. A lot to think about and ponder upon and enough for one episode of Daily Neville. I'm going to invite you to sit and soak in these ideas and begin to contemplate the discipleship of these qualities of your own mind. In the next, we will continue and conclude this chapter on the 12 disciples. Until then, imagine wisely, my friends, and I will see you in the next. Thank <laughs> you.